Our fall series is taking us through the book of Nehemiah. If you know anything about Nehemiah, uh, he was one of the people that was born in exile. Uh, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, destroyed the city. And God says it's because of their disobedience to him as his people. About 141 years later, 445 B.C., Nehemiah, who was cupbearer to the king of Persia himself, asked for permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. Nehemiah rebuilt not your garden variety wall either. This was a wall that was a mile and a half in circumference. It was about 15 feet tall and in many places was six to nine feet thick. He built the wall in 52 days using a group of people who were discouraged, defeated, had very few resources, and were under constant threat of opposition, even at the risk of losing their very lives. As we study the book of Nehemiah, we're going to study the pursuit of excellence. If, if anybody exemplified excellence, it was Nehemiah. He was an excellent leader. He was an excellent motivator. He was an excellent delegator. He was an excellent organizer and planner. He was excellent at handling conflict. And we're going to look at all those areas of excellence. But when people recognized that Nehemiah led the walls to be rebuilt in 52 days, they often looked at his giftedness. But it wasn't his giftedness that led to such incredible service for God. I would submit to you that it was his prayerfulness. Turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1, your mobile devices. Nehemiah actually gives credit to God himself for the building of the walls. In Nehemiah 6, when the walls are complete, Nehemiah 6 verse 16 Nehemiah says that the hearts of our enemies melted when they perceived that the work was accomplished with the help of our God. I wish I could stand before you this morning and tell you that I am a great man of prayer. That would be lying. It's just not true. Oh, I know how to pray. And I know I'm supposed to pray. Believe it or not, I actually want to pray. I just pray so little. And you want to know the one reason why? Because I really trust in my own efforts. When the pressure's on and the deadlines are coming, I get busy. I roll up my shirt sleeves, and I work, and I settle for manpower instead of divine supernatural power. Maybe you can relate. For those of you who know Laurie and me, uh, we're sort of reverse Green Acres, uh, I'm Zsa, Zsa I guess. Uh, I like the city life. Laurie's uh, Eddie Arnold. She's the country girl. She likes to get on her tractor, plow the pasture, clean out the barns, brush the horses. Me, I just snooze. Before we had the pasture, our property had hundreds of lob lolly pines. What, 90, 100 feet tall? I know you, you who are green are going to hate me for this, but we took them all down. 
and we built a beautiful pasture. Now, can you imagine me facing 300, 100-foot loblolly pines with a handsaw? I mean, I'd be done after half a tree. But then a neighbor comes along with a, with a power saw, a chainsaw. One, two, three. The difference between a chainsaw and a handsaw is dramatic. What do you think the difference is between manpower and divine supernatural power? Yet when the chips are down and the deadlines are coming, I roll up my shirt sleeves and I get busy. But when I work, I work. When I pray, God works. And by the way, this is true of every arena of life. I don't care if you're a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. I don't care if you're a doctor, a lawyer, a salesperson, a teacher, an administrator. You either put more trust in your own work, your own efforts, your own competency and gifts, or you put more trust in divine supernatural power through prayer. And the only revelation of which you put your trust in how much do you pray? The average person today spends close to two hours on the internet every day. The average pastor, this is good news, spends five times as long as the typical congregant in prayer. Sounds good, doesn't it? Guess how much the average congregant spends in prayer every day? One minute. Two statistics. We spend on average one minute in prayer. Pastors spend on average five minutes in prayer. But we spend two hours on the internet. If we're to see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we must get about this business of prayer. Nehemiah leads us into the pursuit of excellence in our prayer lives. Let's all stand out of reverence for God's word. <clears throat> Follow along with me as I read Nehemiah chapter 1. Most of chapter 1 is a prayer. There are nine prayers, at least, of Nehemiah through the book. This is the first one. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Kislev, that's November, December, in the 20th year, that's the 20th year of King Artaxerxes of Persia, that's 445 BC, 141 years after Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians. As I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. 
Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Again, this man is the king, Artaxerxes. Now I was cupbearer to the king. May God bless the hearing and teaching of his inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. This is God's very word. And one of the reasons he gave it to us was that we might cease to trust in our own gift packages and cry out to him in prayer for divine power. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now not because that's just what we do after we read Scripture, not because that's some liturgical part of our service. God, we come to you now because we desperately need you. Evil is fighting against us. Evil does not want us to learn how to pray. Evil is doing all it can to keep us from prayer. And, oh God, we desperately need you. Open our eyes, unblock our ears, soften our hearts, and call us to prayer. Invite us. Woo us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. If you look closely at this prayer in chapter 1, you actually see a very common paradigm to lead us through a time of prayer. Many of us have heard the paradigm, A-C-T-S, Acts. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And as we look at this prayer, it's exactly how Nehemiah prays. A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Let's dig in. First of all, how do we pursue excellence in our prayer lives? Pursue excellence in adoration. Praise, worship. Notice how Nehemiah begins his prayer. Look at verse 5. God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Adoration gets us to focus on God's character. Adoration builds our faith so that we long confidently to go before God in prayer. As we praise God, we gain perspective. God grows big. Our problems grow small. God grows big. Our faith grows big. As we spend time in adoration, our prayers take flight. Because God is powerful, because he's the God of heaven, we know he's able to hear our prayers. But you know what? All of us know that he's able. You know what's amazing in this adoration portion? Look at the second part of verse 5. Who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Not only is God able to answer our prayers, God is willing to answer our prayers. Do you believe that? Can I just tell you I struggle to believe that? But Nehemiah spends time worshiping God praising God, adoring God. And one of the attributes Nehemiah praises God for is he's the covenant-keeping God. God has pledged himself to his people. God has pledged all his resources, all his power to his people. God has pledged his steadfast love to his people. God, listen to me, folks, God desires, longs, and delights to answer your prayer more than you desire him to answer your prayer. 
That's what it means when Nehemiah adores God as the covenant-keeping God. And then in verse 11, Nehemiah ends his prayer as he began it in adoration. The prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. Worship of the beauty of God. Worshiping God isn't isn't a duty, it's a delight. And grace changes duty to delight. And what we learn here is Nehemiah engages in adoration, his heart begins to delight to fear the Lord. And what we learn about prayer through adoration is no matter what we're about to pray about, no matter what we're about to pray for, We're reminded through adoration that the greatest gift is not the gift of the giver. The greatest gift is the giver. Through adoration, praise, and worship, we're reminded that no matter what our needs are, no matter what our requests are, what we most need, what we most desire at the core of our beings is God himself. So how do we pursue excellence in adoration? Well, I want to make this a very applicable sermon. If you look at your sermon notes inside the weekly, uh, you're going to see a link that you can go to on our app. Uh, If you go to Sunday morning and then the sermon notes pop up, and then when the sermon notes pop up, there's a link that will take you to two action points for adoration. The first action point of how we pursue excellence in adoration are the attributes of God. These are some of God's attributes. Again, first of all, he's infinite. So that means there's an infinite number of attributes. He's infinite. He's eternal. He's unchanging. He's omnipotent, all power. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He's all wise. He knows how to put all his knowledge to perfect use. He's faithful. He's good. He's holy. He's righteous. He's just. He's compassionate. He's loving, gracious, merciful, kind, glorious, beautiful, sovereign, imminent. He's near, transcendent. He is so far away in that he's unlike us. And he's to be revered and adored and worshipped. And all you need to do, if you, want to, if you want to spend more than one minute a day, ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication, just pick one of these a day and adore God. Just take his infinite nature. Oh God, I can't even fathom something that's infinite. I'm so finite. I'm so fallen. You're infinite. There's no limits to any of your attributes. Your love is infinite. Your holiness is infinite. Your grace and your mercy is infinite. God, I'm lost in your infinite nature. I've only spent about 30 seconds. I'm halfway to my one minute. Right? Pick one of these a day. And focus on it and endure God. Now, there's a second tool we can use. This is also on the app that will take you to a link. And those are the Old Testament names of God. El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. Adonai, Lord and Master. By the way, your English versions can actually give you hints as to what the Hebrew is. If you see capital L, small o, small o, small d, that's Adonai, that's Lord, Master, King. But if you see All caps, L-O-R-D, well, that's Yahweh or Jehovah. That's God's covenant name, his personal name to his personal people. He keeps covenant. He's intimate. And then Jehovah, Yahweh, with the rest of these um, titles, make up other names. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner of victory. Do you feel defeated? Do you feel attacked? Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord, my shepherd. Jehovah Rophi, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is there. Jehovah Makedesh, the Lord who sanctifies. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts of the angel armies of heaven. You can just pick one of these a day. You have one attribute and one name of God. And you begin to adore God according to those attributes. And you'll be amazed at what happens 
the same thing that happened in Nehemiah. Your faith begins to grow. Your prayers begin to take flight. And you're confident and bold before the throne of grace. Pursue excellence in adoration. A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. So secondly, pursue excellence in confession. Now, I don't like cats. I love dogs. Don't like cats. Many people, they want to use cats for their paradigm for prayer. Instead of acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, they want to use cats. C-A-T-S, confession, adoration, thanksgiving, supplication. And they want to do that because they think, how can I even go before God's presence when maybe he won't hear me? I've got to get all fessed up. Let me just challenge that for a moment. The Lord's Prayer. Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer. You don't get to confession, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, trespasses, debts, whatever your tradition is. Two-thirds of the way through the prayer, Jesus calls us to confession. Don't fear as a child of God that God's ear is not going to be bent toward you because of unconfessed sin in your life. Because guess what? If that's true, he's never going to bend his ear toward you. Because when do you think you ever don't have unconfessed sin in your life? If sin kept God from hearing us, we would all be hopeless. And so that's why Jesus isn't necessarily in a hurry to get us to think about confession. As a matter of fact, when we engage in adoration first, God's character exposes our lack of it. And it leads us to deeper confession. And as we engage in adoration of God as loving and kind and merciful, we're also drawn to the throne of grace to be absolutely transparent and vulnerable and honest about our sin. So we engage in adoration, and that leads to confession. And that is exactly how Nehemiah prays. Look at verse 4. He says, I continued in fasting and praying. So he's already doing that. We know what his first step is. Verse 5, he praises God. And then look at verses 6 and 7. Adoration, confession. Nehemiah confesses sin. Three times in verses 6 and 7, you see the word sin. It's the same word in different forms. You've probably heard what it means before. If you get an archer and you have a bullseye and you pull back the bow and you shoot the arrow... The distance by which the archer misses the bullseye is called the sin of the arrow. Sin means missing the mark. What's the mark? Nehemiah tells us in verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments. Not keeping the commandments, the statues, the rules. Not in and of themselves as rules, but remember, if God is good, then all of his commandments, all of his statutes, all of his rules are an invitation to our highest delight and pleasure. If God's good, that's what it means. If God is good, and he is, and he's kind, as he is, then his prohibition is actually a warning against our worst nightmare. God is not some cosmic killjoy, folks. He's good. He's really good. He loves you and he wants the very best for you. So his commandments invite you to the best. His prohibitions warn you against the worst. And yet, we need to confess we act very corruptly because we do not obey God's commands. What are God's commands in the summation? Perfect love for God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength 24-7 perfectly. Do y'all do that? I don't do that for a moment and neither do you. 
love your neighbor as yourself perfectly, 24-7. Do you do that? I don't do that. We, we could spend all day just confessing our lack of love. But what we need to do is use Scripture to lead us in confession. At Oak Mountain, we talk about a three-step dance with Christ that leads to intimacy and transformation. We call it the three-step, the waltz, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. The first step of the waltz is repent. Repent, believe, fight. Repent, believe, fight. Repent. God says he opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That means grace flows downhill. Grace flows to the person humbled on his or her knees over his or her sin. Confession leads to transformation. So pursue excellence in confession. See, if we don't understand God's grace, if we don't spend time adoring God for his grace, then we're going to do what Adam and Eve did in the garden. We're going to hide from God. We're going to hide our sin from God. We're going to hide our sin from others. We're going to feel our nakedness, and we're going to be ashamed, and we're going to hide. We're going to get defensive. We're going to blame shift. We're going to excuse make. But if we adore God for his grace, what's Romans 2, 4 say? The kindness of God leads us to repentance. And then notice in verse 6 that Nehemiah confesses the sins of the people of Israel. I think sometimes in our individualistic American culture, we tend to miss the supernatural, mystical communion of the saints. If you know Jesus, you're united to Christ. I know I know Jesus, and I'm united to Christ. Therefore, spiritually and mystically, we're connected. Really, not philosophically, really and truly. Or either, if that's not true, if you and I are not connected together in Christ, then that means I'm not really connected to Christ. But if I'm really connected to Christ, and you're really connected to Christ, we've got to be connected to each other, really and truly. And this is why the church historically has confessed its sins corporately. We are guilty of the sins of the church as a whole all over the world. That's what Nehemiah confesses. Nehemiah wasn't even alive when the sins that he's confessing occurred. But he knew because of the mystical union of the saints, he needed to confess those sins. So how has the church been guilty of sin as a whole? What's the number one complaint against the church? We're a bunch of hypocrites. You know why people say that? Because it's partly true. And we need to confess the hypocrisy of the church. Sometimes people say the church is legalistic and judgmental, self-righteous. You know why they say that? Because it's partly true. And we need to confess the self-righteousness of the church. But there's other elements of the church that are self-indulgent and gives the world the idea that Christians don't really care deeply about sin. And so we need to confess that spirit of self-indulgence. People don't see any difference between the church and its priorities and the people of the world. Christians are pursuing personal peace, affluence, comfort. And we need to confess that. The church has failed to represent God by not standing up for causes of justice and mercy. And we need to confess that. But then also look at verse 6. Nehemiah makes all sin relational. He says, we have sinned against you. That's what David says in Psalm 51 as well. Against you and you only have I sinned. By the way, if you're looking for application on how to grow in confession, use Psalm 51. Maybe you didn't commit adultery. Maybe you have. Maybe you haven't had physical adultery, but certainly we've committed spiritual adultery. Isn't that what the book of Hosea is all about? 
So you can use David's psalm of repentance for adultery as your repentance and confession. But notice, ultimately, it is all relational. All sin is not primarily behavioral. It is relational because it is done against God. Something you all may know about me is I'm an audiophile. I love music, and I love all kinds of music, except for old-timey country. I can't get into that as much. But when I say I'm into music, I mean, I mean I'm like, I'm old school. Like, vinyl's coming back. Did you know that? Vinyl is coming back. So I've got my record player. I've got my 45-year-old receiver that, that still is better. I got it repaired the other day, and the guy says, they don't make them like this anymore. You can't buy this anymore. I am into it. Put the stylus on the vinyl and sit back and listen to a whole side. You know, we're, we're so ADD today when it comes to music, right? We just hit, well, I want that track, I want that track. I digress. I just get excited about these things. Well, if you want to pursue excellence in confession, you need to realize that God is constantly spinning the record and putting the stylus on waltz music. Another link that I have in your notes that you can go to is the types of waltz music. The needle comes down and the dance music starts. Relationships. Do you realize that relationships is the number one popular music of waltzing? <laughs> your, your, your marriage, your parenting, your work associates, your fellow Christians. The person that's driving like a crazy man on 280. It's, it's a relationship on the highway, but it's relationships. Nothing exposes sin like relationships. So waltz through your relationships. And when you're exposed, confess. They're sins of the tongue. Jesus says that the heart, out of the heart, the tongue speaks. So the, the tongue merely reveals what's going on in your soul. Listen to your words. How are you grumbling, complaining? Sins of the thought life. See, it's not just behaviors. Jesus says if you say you fool, you've committed murder. Attitudes of the heart. Sins of omission. Things you haven't done, you should have done. Sins of commission. Things you shouldn't have done that you did do. Sins of self-righteousness. Sins of self-indulgence. Using scripture as waltz music. You know the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, all that stuff. Pick one fruit every day and just repent through it. Love. How am I not loving? Use 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Love is patient. Love is kind. How am I not patient? How am I not kind? When you read Scripture, don't roll up your shirt sleeves thinking, i got to get busy. Instead, your first move should always be confession. You read scripture and you say, God, how am I not doing this? God, how am I not acting like this? God, how am I not thinking this? You think, well, Bob, that sounds really oppressive. No, it doesn't. Look, you are declared righteous before God because of the finished work of Christ. You have nothing to fear. And what's getting in the way of greater intimacy is unconfessed sin. So let Scripture expose you and enter into excellence in confession. And remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive us our sins and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've got to get cranking here. Number three, A-C-T-S, thanksgiving. Look at verse 8. Nehemiah says, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. Now, isn't that ridiculous? For a human being to try to remind the infinite God, the all-knowing God. Well, Nehemiah is not necessarily reminding God. He's giving thanks to God for God's word, God's promises, things that God has said. Remember your word you commanded Moses that if you return to me, I will gather you from all the places I've sent you. Nehemiah uses God's word, God's promises as cause for thanksgiving. Look at verse 10. We are God's servants who is re he is redeemed by his great power. Giving thanks to God for our salvation. 
your adoption. If you know Christ, you're adopted into God's family. How many times does Jesus use the parenting illustration to encourage us and woo us to prayer? If your son asks for a fish, you won't give him a snake. If your daughter asks for a loaf, you won't give give her a stone. If you then, being evil, know how to give what is good to your children, then how much more will your Father in heaven give what is good to those who ask? Give thanks for being a child of God, and your faith will soar, and your prayers will gain wings. Think of all the promises related to prayer in Scripture you can thank God for. James 5, Elijah was a man just like us, and he prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't. And then he prayed again that it would rain, and it did. Why does God tell us about that? Because he wants you to thank him for that promise and to trust it. Mark 11, 24, by the way, this isn't all your Bibles. This isn't some charismatic health, wealth, prosperity Bible I'm reading from. This is your Bible I'm reading from. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Listen to this. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. People, you can't excise that from your Bibles. It's there. It says it. God is wooing us, calling us to give thanks to him for his promises that our prayers might have power. John 14, 13 and 14, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. If you ask me for anything, I will do it. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish and it will be done. John 16, 24, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Why is it so important to practice thanksgiving? Look, you you have two options when it comes to your attitude. You can be bitter, you can be complaining, you can be resentful, you can be angry, and you can be filled with unbelief. Or you can give thanks for the small things all throughout the day, and you develop, and God develops in you, an attitude where prayer can grow and prayer can fly to the throne of grace. It's your choice. You can choose to be unthankful or you can choose to be thankful. If you choose to be thankful, an atmosphere, the oxygen of prayer begins to multiply. Ann Voskamp wrote a book called A Thousand Gifts. It's really well done. She just lists a thousand little things with some narrative in between of, of, of small things she's thankful for. And again, she points us to how it builds an atmosphere of faith. Number 22, mail in the mailbox. I resonate with that. There's just something great about getting mail that's not junk mail. Number 118, the crackling of wood in a fireplace. Do you see what she's saying? Just find small things to give thanks to God for. And all of a sudden, your whole attitude and perspective begins to change. And now the oxygen of prayer begins to take over. Number 243, clean sheets that smell like the wind. That was huge in Pennsylvania, right? It'd be cold winter's night. We'd leave the sheets on till right before bed, make the beds jump in. It's cold. It smells like outside. It's just something to be thankful for. Number 526, new toothbrushes. Come on, how many people can't feel thankful with new toothbrushes? I thought of some on my own. A full tank of gas. I I don't know what it is, but when I fill up and I pull out, I am so thankful. I know it's silly, but it's true. I've noticed it in my heart. Freshly cut lawn. I love pulling out the driveway after I've cut the grass. And you can see the tire marks, and it's clean, and there's no leaves. Matter of fact, when the first leaf falls, I want to get out there and cut it all over again. There's something about freshly cut lawn that, that I'm so thankful for. My wife, Lori, her laugh. I don't know if you all have ever heard Lori laugh, but if you have, you're thankful for it. I love her laugh. You can choose 
to be unthankful. Or you can choose to find little things all through the day to give thanks for. And if you engage in thanksgiving, the atmosphere of prayer explodes in your life. A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then lastly, supplication. Supplication are the actual requests. Isn't it interesting that Nehemiah's paradigm and the paradigm that many of us use, A-C-T-S, the last thing you worry about is what you're going to pray, to pray. He taught constantly about persistence in prayer, about persevering in prayer. Luke 18, there's the, the parable of the, of the widow and the unjust judge. And she goes to him day after day after day after day, and the judge doesn't care about her, but she wears him out by her persistence. And then Jesus says this, but when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Wait a minute, Jesus, you weren't talking about faith. You're talking about prayer. Luke 18, 1 says, Jesus taught a parable that we should always pray and never give up. But then he ends it with, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? What's that got to do with anything? It's got everything. How quickly do you give up on your prayers? That, that's what Jesus is talking about. And by the way, if you look at Nehemiah, it says he sat down and wept and mourned for days. And if you compare verse 4 with chapter 2, verse 1, we find out that he prayed every day and every night for over five months straight. He prayed the same prayer every day and every night for five months straight. Abraham prayed for 25 years for a son. For Isaac, the people of God in the Old Testament prayed for 400 years from the time of the last prophet for Messiah to come. And notice that when Nehemiah finally does pray, it's one request. Look at verse 11. Give me mercy before this man. All the waiting in prayer led to one request. The principle is this. If we engage in adoration, confession, and thanksgiving, it's very likely that God the Spirit will lead us to the one request that will change the world. So we rush in with a hundred requests. and There's not necessarily anything wrong with that, okay? But if we engaged in listening prayer, engaged in adoration, confession, and thanksgiving, maybe the one prayer we then utter can change the world. Now, we do, in fact, have options, just like I have given you options and action points. Uh, there's different ways to engage in supplication. Here's one simple way. Choose a day of the week and find a word or a supplication that matches the sound of the day of the week. For instance, Monday, magistrates. Pray for the government on Mondays. Tuesday, town. Pray for all the ministries in Birmingham, over the fence, over the mountain. Wednesday, the world. Pray for missions. Thursday, threats. Pray about your fears, your anxieties, your worries. Friday, friends and family. Saturday, society, social issues, mercy and justice. Sunday, the Sabbath. Pray about our church. There are all kinds of ways that we can create supplications. Uh, on the round table out there, there's the, the missions booklet that, that'll give you a list. The whole month of October, we're going to have 30 days of prayer for 30 years of a church. There'll be all kinds of supplications. Bottom line is, you want to know how to make supplications or how to engage in ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. Be around people who know how to pray. Because they've been around people who know how to pray. Because they've been around people who know how to pray. i never forget as a new believer at Penn State, we would have prayer meetings when I was Campus Crusade for Christ. And I didn't know how to pray. I'd never even been around people who prayed out loud. And I didn't, I, I, was, I was petrified. I was intimidated. And so you know what I did? I listened. I learned how to pray by being around people who knew how to pray. Because they had been around people who knew how to pray. And they had been around people who knew how to pray. 
You learn how to pray by being around people who know how to pray. One of my great joys over the 30 years of ministry here at Oak Mountain has been our prayer groups. Wednesday morning at 6 in my office open to everybody. We pray for an hour. We don't talk, we pray. And we've learned how to pray by being around each other who pray. Saturday mornings at 7 in my office, anybody can come. We learn how to pray by praying. We don't talk, well, we talk a little bit, but we pray most of the time. You learn how to pray by praying. And then we come to the best news of all. Jesus is the new and best Nehemiah. Jesus is the one who rebuilds the broken down walls in our lives. And one of those broken down walls involves our prayer lives. Hebrews 7, Jesus prays forever, constantly for us. He intercedes for us at the right hand of God. And you know one of the things he's praying for? Your prayer life. And then Romans 8, we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit prays through us with groanings too deep for words. Jesus is the new and best Nehemiah, and he will rebuild the broken walls of your lives, as he will mine, which means he will rebuild our broken down prayer lives. A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. May God give us the grace to pray more than a minute a day. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Thank you for prayer. God, thank you for answering our prayers that evil would be bound. Lord, uh, there's no way that evil wants us to hear about prayer. There's no way that evil wants us to be encouraged about prayer. As a matter of fact, God, I know evil is working overtime to discourage us about prayer so that we don't pray. But God, you've given us some ammo this morning. You've given us some help. We can be people who pray. And we can certainly hang out with people who pray. God, I am ashamed at my prayer life. But I leave this morning having more hope. God, might all of us have hope. And Lord, if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know Christ, we pray that their first prayer would be, Oh, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Save me according to your promise in your finished work. God, we love you. We want to love you more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.